in. Thank you, Toby. What we're going to do stop. first okay. is take a look. And you've seen this before if you're at the beach as a kid. Maybe your mom or dad did this to kind of impress you. They take a bucket of water and swing the bucket of water around and nothing comes out. You might be like, oh my gosh, that's amazing. So this cup is filled to about here. I did it one year with like a, a wine glass on a platform and it worked well, but I'm worried that if it ever fell in its glass, I should worry. So I used a paper cup this year. It should work. It provided this tension. The cord doesn't rip through the cup. So hopefully nobody gets sprayed with water. So the idea is that if you swing it fast enough, even though it's filled, it's filled with water right now, none of the water is going to come out. Okay, look. There's actually, I'm not messing around. There is water. There's enough water that if you poured it even a little bit, it would start to come out right there. Okay? So the idea, though, is that when you spin it, if you spin it fast enough, the water stays in the cup. But if I slow down at the top, what would happen? Oh, no. <laughs> What would happen if I slow down? Don't jump. No water spills out, right? But if you go fast enough, it's not going to spill. Anybody want to come up and try? Let's go up and change your trip. Oh my! Let me get a bit of towel to clean this up. Stand over there. Yeah, Lisa. You gotta swing it fast. Yeah, Lisa, swing it. Swing it. Swing it. Good. Lisa, double. Good. 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 Lisa, good. Do a few like just days of labs, and this would be one of them where we could build our own. You guys can test it out, but we would need to do it in like the commons or something, or, somewhere like it, or the jug yard. We spill water and stuff, but we'll do it this way. But the idea it is raining. Wow, the idea that uh, you see that unbelievable. Um, <laughs> the idea that the water is not spilling out has to do with the actual motion now. What we can say is this, the water, the water wants to kind of like fly off away from the circle, right? So think about the cup, it was moving in a circular fashion. If I were to just let go of the cup when I was spinning it like this at the top, it would just launch off, okay, and the water would go flying. But there's something that's keeping it from doing that. Now, what do you think in this example was keeping that cup in circular motion or keeping that yeah, keeping that cup filled with water in the motion or in that circular motion. Well, like the cup and the water are being accelerated away from the circle, sort of like they want to travel through space from whatever release point. And since they're accelerated away from the circle, at any point they're going to stay as far away from the center as possible. So the water stays pressed to the bottom of the cup. And the cup stays um, taut and straight. Yeah, so that, that's exactly right, James. Now, somebody follow up. That's act exactly right. Very good. What if, or what forces, and give me names, what forces are apparent here, like force of friction? Gravity. What forces are apparent that keep this in motion and keep the water in the cup? Think about it for a second before you answer. But what forces are apparent here that keep the water in the cup and the force that keeps the cup in motion. Gravity. Okay, gravity. What do you mean by gravity? Yeah. Uh, actually, no, I don't know if that would make sense because would gravity make the water fall out? Well, gravity helps it when it's at the bottom of the path, right? Yeah. So at the bottom of the path, gravity is. What about the top? That's the yeah. That's the question now because gravity is definitely taking effect in this problem. Okay. There's some momentum that's going on. There's angular momentum, sure, giving it velocity, and the velocity is causing something else. But again, the question is what force? Like uh, force of friction, oh, force of gravity. Pull, pulling force. Okay, pulling force. What do you mean by pulling force? Like, like, it's like you're pulling it this way, so, it's so what do we call that? James used the word before he said something. Normal force is there. Hold off on that, though. Let's go back to pulling force for a second. We'll go to normal force in a minute. What's another word for pulling force, or what can we say is that? Force of tension. Remember the tension in the cord? When this cup is spun around, there is tension in the cord. Watch. Like right now, is there any tension in this cord at all? No. There's no tension in this cord right here. Like this piece, I mean, sorry. That I'm like just flimsying around. But the minute I hold it here, the weight of the water 
is, it, is causing this tension in the cord. The tension in the cord is what's causing this cup to not fly off. If I were to spin this, and imagine suddenly a scissor could just cut this right here as it was spinning, right? It would just shoot off into whatever direction it was going. If I were to release it at the bottom like a softball pitcher, the ball would go tangent to the circle or go that way if I released it at the bottom. If I released it at the side here, it would get launched straight up. And we'll talk about this direction in a moment. But tension is what's keeping the cup moving. Now, second part, second part, what's keeping the water in the cup? And explain how. Well, what's the answer, sorry? Normal. Good, normal force, and how? Uh, I'm guessing because like with the momentum when it comes to the top, everyone's going that way, so it has to be pushing the opposite way. Mm -hmm. That's all I got. So every time there's a force on a surface, the reaction force is what we call the normal force. And that's exactly what he's describing here. So if I'm spinning this around, the water is pushing against the walls of the cup. The cup is doing what? It's pushing up. Yeah, up or just what? Back Pushing back, right? It's like an action reaction. So you hit the table, what does the table do to you? I mean, nothing, but technically it hits back, meaning it stops you. If you were to punch through the table, it would do nothing. But every time you hit something, there's a reaction, right? You feel it. If you punch like the table, you're going to feel it in your hand. It's not like you don't feel it at all. It's the same thing here. The water is pushing against the walls of the cup. The cup is providing a normal force against the water, keeping it in the cup itself causing it to not shoot off in any direction. Okay, so we're looking at our forces here. Now, today we're going to take a look quickly at circular motion, and then tomorrow we're going to finish it up. All right? So the two objectives here are going to be to determine what's called a tangential speed and centripetal acceleration. And that's what James was mentioning in the beginning, the idea that the uh, cup in circular motion has some acceleration. And then to understand the causes of circular motion, what causes it. First, Tangential speed. In geometry, did you learn the word tangent with regards to a circle? No. I'm going to give you a quick... Okay. So if you have a circle here like this. Okay. Now, if you have a segment that happens to touch the circle at only one location. Like that. This is called a point of tangency. Please label that if this isn't... If this is not like second nature to you right now, label it. Okay, point of tangency. Whenever something touches a circle once, it's a tangent line. Anybody remember the other word from geometry? That if it does this, we're not going to use this right now, but just a quick fun fact. What was it called if it touched twice? A chord or if it go a chord, yes. A chord is if it's a segment and it stops, but if it has lines at the end of it, we call it a secant. It's similar to a chord. It's just a line instead of a line segment. A chord is a line segment that ends at the outer points of the circle, but a line that continues forever is called the secant. We are going to be looking at, in this case, what's called the tangential speed. Okay, the tangential speed. And this is the speed of the object that's in circular motion. And the speed is called tangent to the path for this reason. Let's explain this real quick. And the easiest example is softball. Okay, so a softball pitcher, does anybody play softball here? Forget it. Okay. Ladies, you want anybody pitch by any chance? Either of you pitch? Or have you pitched? You Stu, do you know the idea of a windmill throw and how it works? Where would you release the ball, Katie, if you're pitching for the windmill? Yeah, at your hip. The whole idea is that you want to release at your hip. So take a look up and imagine this for a moment. A softball pitcher winds her arm up and releases at the hip as she steps with her right foot, correct? It's the opposite of baseball? Or do you step with the left foot? It is the, okay. I don't know how it works, softball. So you take a step, right, and you throw. And you release right here at the bottom of the path. Now, when the softball pitcher releases at the bottom of the path, the ball travels parallel to the ground. So let's draw a quick diagram of that. Here's the girl's arm taking a windmill pattern. And at the bottom of the path here, the softball is released and it travels parallel to the ground. Here's the ground, and there's the ball's path. Her arm goes like this, and she releases at the bottom, and the ball travels parallel to the ground. Well, take a look at this line. If I were to complete the circle, complete the circle and finish off the path, we'll notice that this line here, and I'll extend it in blue, 
is tangent to the circle. A similar thing to what we mentioned a moment ago, this point of tangency over here, the path of the softball is also tangent to the circle. Because, as Katie mentioned, when you release it at the bottom, it goes parallel to the ground. Well, the velocity is the direction of that line. So what we could say is that at any point in time, the velocity is tangent to the circle. So that's the velocity right there. So if I were to do the same thing as a softball player, okay, and go through this windmill motion, but instead I release it right here, where's the ball going to go? It's going to go straight upward. If I were to release it like this, it would go backward at the top. If I were to somehow release it here, which is almost impossible for me, go it would go down. straight down. But it always moves tangent to the circle. It's similar to the idea that if you had like a, a lanyard, and you were to spin a lanyard or a lasso, a cowboy that actually used a lasso, they release the lasso at the side, when it's at the side, so that it travels forward. Because again, a, three to, a circle like this, watch my hand, I'm kind of doing it in a plain space this way. If I were to take a lasso and spin it like this and let go over here, here's the circle, here's the point on the edge of the circle, tangent would be that way. Because here's, the, again, look straight up, here's the circle, if I release here, that would be tangent. So as you release a lasso, it goes that direction because it releases tangent to the circle. So if you try that with a lanyard, and you want to take a lanyard, you want to throw it forward, you would release it at the side because it would then go forward. Because you'd be kind of like, you know, taking this plane and drawing it this way. Which is kind of weird to draw because it's a third dimension. But this is what I'm talking about here. Okay, like a circle like that above your head. Okay, and here's the, here's the cowboy. That's a big lasso, I guess. Spinning the lasso, right? <laughs> above the head and then throwing it, but again, you'd have to release it at the side in order for it to go forward, okay, in order for it to go forward there. Have you ever been lassoed? I have not been lassoed, no. Have you? No. All right. So if... Do you want to enlighten us, or is that... So if we were... Let's continue to draw in our circle over here on the left, please. If the softball pitcher were to release the ball by accident, and he got stuck in her hand, and she released it in front of her again, we said it would go straight up. So here, if it were released, the ball would go upward. Okay? Again, it's always tangent to the circle. If the ball were released at the top, it would go this way. Because again, which way is the circle moving? Follow the circle. This is the way the arm is moving, right? It's going counterclockwise. Guys, come on. It's going counterclockwise here, counterclockwise. We should know our directionals, by the way. I'll put it at the bottom. This is counterclockwise. This is clockwise. In case you've never heard this or never understood the meaning, look at a clock. A clock, the direction a clock moves, stop, come on. The direction a clock moves is called clockwise. So clockwise here is just indicating the direction a clock would move. Another word for counterclockwise is anticlockwise. It's the same thing. If you see that in your book at all. Would counterclockwise be negative? Yeah, it's like having a negative direction. As long as you call one of them positive, we'd call the other one negative. We're going to see when we study torque, we're going to look at negative and positive torques and we have to indicate that clockwise is positive and counterclockwise is negative or vice versa. Remember how I said up could be negative and down could be positive? as long as you're consistent in the problem, okay? Um, and then finally, the last part we want to just mark off, let's mark off this fourth point, and there could be an infinite amount of points, remember? A circle is made up of an infinite amount of points in an arc, and we have, it would be going down if released on that end. So take a look at your diagram, no matter where it's released, no matter where it's released, the object would move tangent to its path, tangent to its path. Okay, so all of those lines are the velocity of the object at different points in time. Okay? Yeah. The point of tangency is these blue dots I'm marking off. There are many points of tangency in a circle. It just means that the, if the object were paused in time right here, the velocity would be acting this way. If you pause it in time right here, the velocity would be acting this way, but always tangent to the circle. Okay, so if you ever... If you ever pause and take a, like a quick freeze frame of something moving in circular motion, and you want to know which way the velocity is acting, just look tangent to the circle. So if we paused it and the person's arm was here, so here's the softball pitcher, she's winding up, ready? She goes like this, and she's coming, I'm going through the whole step of the windmill, right? 
as she's coming up, right here, the velocity is up. Right here, it's back. Right here, it's down. And then at the bottom, when she releases, it's forward. That's these four points in time that I'm trying to show you if we freeze frame along the way. Okay, but the idea is that it's tangent to the circle, James. So, I mean, the tire inflation is not quite, but cars more or less force things, force the ground away at the point of end. Yes, absolutely. There's a, there's a force of friction that acts tangent to the circle, which is called rolling friction that provides some sort of push forward. Yep. So James is saying, think about the tire, right? Isn't a tire technically just touching the ground a little bit? Even though the tire technically flattens out a little bit at the bottom, so there's a little surface area of contact, which is actually a rectangular shape, if you think about it. Um, but if you think about a point of tangency at the bottom there, there's a force of friction that's pushing against the road, and then the road is pushing back against the car. That's what's causing it to propel forward, and that does indeed happen to be tangent to the circle. James is right about that. Very good. Good point. Okay, let's take a look at a quick example here. Okay? Question first? Okay. Let's take a quick look at an example of a theoretical one here. So first, three people are at an amusement park riding on a merry-go-round. They're sitting on three different horses at distances R, 2R, and 3R from the center of the merry-go-round. R meaning just some distance, R radius, right? R, double that distance, and then triple that distance. If the floor of the merry-go-round is fixed then which person has the highest, what's called, tangential speed? Okay, this is theoretical. Let's think about it for a minute. Can we quickly just draw a diagram before answering? I have a question. Is it, is it like... like um, Don't answer, just ask a question. You know, they, have the, they have this thing that, like, playground, I think, where they used to. Where, like, you swing, you just want one thing, you swing, and the closer you go, the faster you go. That, that's, that has to do with this topic. That's not this exact thing, but that is related to centripetal and circular motion, yeah. That's like skaters. You ever see ice skaters? When they spin figure skaters, they either open their arms or they tuck and they close their arms. That changes their rotational inertia, which causes them to spin faster or slower. It actually is physics beyond. The whole ice skating is so much physics, unbelievable. That's, they also apply to doing a front flip or a back flip. The tighter you tuck, the faster you spin on the air. Absolutely. That's exactly right. Yeah. All right, good, Julian. Is that a little parkour knowledge? Yeah. yeah. All right, so let's look at a bird's eye view of this merry-go-round. Okay, let's draw a small circle to start. We're gonna draw three concentric circles. Draw three circles. Okay, concentric meaning with the same center. Like a bullseye almost, okay? Here's the center of the merry-go-round. There are three different horses on the merry-go-round. All of them rotating on a fixed surface. So at a certain point in time, they're all gonna be here. Follow what I'm saying? They're moving at the same angular speed. As this one goes 90 degrees, this one goes 90 degrees. They all move together. James. Okay. Now, I already gave away, not the answer, but part of the idea. The angular, what's called angular speed, is the same. They're both moving 90 degrees in some given time period. Again, the plane, the surface of the merry-go-round is fixed. So as I move this long path on the outside, maybe Tori, who's on the inner merry-go-round horse, moves this short path on the inside. But we both move 90 degrees. So that's what you're seeing here with the blue is like the starting point and red is the ending point. But which of these three horses has the highest tangential, tangential speed in this problem? Which is the highest tangential speed? And remind, remind me real quick, what is speed defined as? Not velocity, distance. but speed. Distance over time. Distance over time. time. Good. Speed is distance over time. They're not moving at 90 degrees. They moved 90 degrees in a circle, right? This is 90 degrees. So I'm just saying, like, they could have moved 360, which is back to the beginning. They could have moved 180, so just 90 degrees angle. So speed is defined as distance over time. Why? Yes, that's exactly right. The one that's furthest out on the circle is moving with the highest speed in this problem. Okay, with the highest speed in this problem because it moves a further distance. Look at the arc length. I'm going to highlight it if I can figure out how to do this.
All right, so let's take a look at the furthest distance here. That distance there is a lot longer than this distance right here. Wouldn't you agree with me? So if they both move that distance in the same time period, then the one moving along the yellow arc, arc, uh, uh, curved path here, or arc curved path, is got to be, or has got to be moving at a faster speed because they're covering more distance. It'd be like, imagine you're running a track. Teresa, I know you're on track. Don't you start at different points along the track for short races? Because the outer lane is longer, isn't it? If you run the inner lane at the bridle loop, it's a much shorter distance. What, what, which one is the inner one? Is it called the bridle path? The, what is that called? The res loop? All right, the res loop is what? How many miles? 1.5. 1. 1. And the outer one is 1. 1.7, right? Yeah, yeah, so the outer loop, the bridle path is 1.7. The inner, the reservoir loop is only 1.5. It's the same exact thing here. But if two people finish at the exact same time running that loop, the one that ran the outer loop has got to be running faster, right? Because they ran a further distance. So the same thing happens here. The person on the outer loop, if they cover the same angular change, 90 degrees, in the same time period, they're actually running at different speeds though. Again, this is the tangential speed. Okay, so the tangential speed, let's write this down. The tangential speed is greater for the outermost horse. Okay, merry-go-round horses. So the tangential speed, S tangential, speed tangential here, I'm just writing S tangential, is greater for the outermost horse. James. So, there's a relation between the radius in a circle and how much force you need to apply at the center of the circle to get the same force on the outside as one that's like 10 feet versus 30 feet? Yep, absolutely, absolutely. Okay, so as you move further on the circle, it requires more or less force to keep it in that motion. And we'll see that relationship in a little while. Maybe today, maybe tomorrow. Okay? Again, a strictly theoretical type of problem here. Okay? Strictly theoretical kind of problem here. But again, remember that they're angular... You can write this down. Their angular speeds are the same. The angular speeds are the same. And that's something that your book doesn't go into much detail about, <laughs> and that I'm not going to go into heavy detail, but the idea I want you to know. Okay? The angular speeds are the same, because they both cover 90 degrees in the same time period. Remember, angular speed deals with the angle. Angle covered or traversed. 90 degrees. Doesn't change. Yeah, there would be a different problem. You'd have to calculate stuff there. Yeah, it couldn't just be theoretical. But we could, you could do that just by calculating. Yeah, if all the surfaces were on different planes and they kind of like, uh, what's an idea? I'm trying to think of something that spins the inner ring and then the outer ring spins different and then our outer ring even. Any good examples of that? <laughs> Tristan's saying if the three horses were moving at different angular velocities or angular speeds, like if they were on different platforms and they move differently. Can't think of an example of that in real life. Besides this merry go I'm trying to think. I don't know. I'll think again. Um, yeah? Because the surface is fixed. The face of the clock is fixed. No, but I mean the movement of the hands. Oh, yeah. There are different rates. There... They're at the same angular rate, they're different. This, the clock is analogous to what we just did. Oh, yeah, yeah, but it has nothing to do with the surface moving. He's asking, I know what you're saying, James, you could look at it that way, but he's talking about these surfaces moving at different planes. So if this surface was literally moving faster than this surface, and this wheel was moving faster, and they ended up like one was here, one was here, oh, sorry, one was here, and this one might have gotten all the way here after the beginning of it. He's saying, what if they were moving differently? I'll try and think of another example of that, but I can't. Um, it's like Russian roulette type of thing? Nope. <laughs> Not Russian roulette, you just mean roulette. Russian roulette is the game with the revolver that people play. That's, 
You mean just roulette? Yes, the roulette table. But the roulette table is fixed also. There's no like inner, at least there's no inner wheel that's spinning and then an outer wheel that's spinning differently. It's one wheel moving together. The, the, the diameter of the wheel affects the torque, the amount of, well, there's a lot more that affects the torque also, the gear ratio in the car. But. I mean, the torque rating you manage is always higher for truck and wheel. And usually as torque goes up, velocity goes down as well. Yep. All right, let's. The next thing we want to take a look at quickly is objects that are in circular motion, how we can describe them. Now, we talked a minute ago that there's a force of tension in the rope. So let's draw that example of the cup, please. So here's our cup on the outside, moving in circular motion. Here's the rope. Here's the person's hand, okay, connected to that rope. So they're spinning the cup in circular motion. The cup is traveling along this path. All right? Now, as you're spinning this around, we already said that the, tangent, uh, the, the tension force of the rope keeps it in motion so that there's some force of tension pulling back. Okay, everybody see that? There's a force of tension pulling back. Now, from Newton's laws, Newton's laws tells us that if there's a force, there must be an acceleration. Remember, F equals MA. If there's a force, there must also be an acceleration. So that means that technically speaking, there's acceleration in the same direction as this force. Okay, so I'm, in red I'm going to draw another little arrow here. Whoops, that's not red. In red, let's draw another little arrow in here. And we're going to call this A sub C. A sub C. And what this is going to stand for is what's called centripetal acceleration. And I'll write the word down in a moment. Okay? I'll write the word down in a moment, which I think is actually on your next slide. Okay, it's called centripetal acceleration. Centripetal, anybody know what centripetal means? Have you heard that term before? Oh, that makes sense. Cent for 100. Good idea. Cent for 100. What was it? Guess? Center seeking? Did you look ahead there? Good, Lisa. I'm glad. That's the exact word that I use. That's why I asked. Uh, it does mean center seeking. Okay, good. And center seeking just means it's pulling you back to the center. So the cup is moving and it wants to move away from the circle, but the cord is consistently pulling it toward the center. You don't realize it, you really don't, because it looks like, it looks like to me, the cup isn't moving toward the center, right? It's staying at a constant fixed radius. But the cup wants to move outward, so something has to be pulling against it, and that's the tension force. Well, there's acceleration also then. If there's a force, there's acceleration. Remember, F equals MA. If F is some number, then A has to be some number. It doesn't make sense mathematically to think about it. Ready? Just write it down in your mind or just write it down in your paper. If this is some value like 10, everything has mass. Anything spinning has mass. So pick any number like 2. Then there's got to be acceleration. Acceleration equals 5 in this case. Whenever there's a force, there's acceleration. So if there's some sort of force keeping it in circular motion, this tension force, then there must be acceleration. Okay, and the reason there's acceleration, and this is kind of tricky to think about, is because although I could keep this moving constantly, the velocity is changing. The speed is the same, but the velocity is changing. Ready right here. Here's the speed, right? Drawing tangent to the circle. Now let's draw another scenario of the cup over here. We did this before, but we're going to do it again. Now the cup is here, so now the, the speed would act tangent to the circle in this direction. So the first speed is right here. If we pause and look, that's the speed. It's acting tangent to the circle. If I were to release this cup right here, it would shoot straight upward. But then I continue until this point, and now the speed is acting this direction. What do you notice about the direction of the speed? The direction of the speed is changing, right? First it's acting up, then it's acting backward. And if you remember, velocity, velocity has to do with not only the amount of speed, but also its direction. 
So when I, disco- when I describe a velocity, don't I usually say 4 meters per second east or positive or 4 meters per second west or negative 4 meters per second whenever we talk about velocity? So velocity has to do with the direction. So technically speaking, the velocity here is up, the velocity here is back. Because the velocity's direction changed, there has to be acceleration. Because acceleration is defined as change in velocity over time. So because there's a change in the velocity, even though the speed is the same, if I'm sitting here spinning it over and over again with the same speed, you think, oh, it's not changing velocity. It is changing velocity. Because the direction of the speed keeps changing as you go along the circle, which causes the velocity vector to change. And if there's a change in velocity, there is some sort of acceleration. So either you can remember it using this method, or using this method, say to yourself, well, because there's a force acting, there's acceleration. Or because the velocity is changing, there is acceleration. Either way describes the reasoning for this. This is the theoretical part. I'm using equations to help us, but it's really theoretical. This is not mathematical. We're not looking at numbers right now. You can ignore the 10 and the 2, and all this stuff still holds true. Okay, so the idea, though, that I want you to write down is that there is acceleration. It's pulling the object to the center of the circular path. Okay, there is acceleration, and it's pulling the object to the center of the circular path. We'll define that acceleration now in the next slide. Thank you. So to finish this, let's quickly just define centripetal acceleration or center-seeking acceleration. It's the acceleration directed toward the center of the circle of an object in circular motion. Now this is not to be confused with centrifugal. Have you ever heard of a centrifuge? Yes. It's this thing that separates blood. If you ever go to the doctor and you give a blood sample, they put in this thing and it spins at a very high rotational speed. And based on the densities of the plasma and the different particles in your blood, it separates it into different parts. And part of your blood is here, part of it is here, and that's how they can separate to analyze the blood. It's called the centrifuge. It's what's called center fleeing. It wants to go to the outside because it's spinning so fast. Think about the Gravitron, the, tr- the ride at the, mer- at the, fer- at the uh, what's that called? Six Flags. Six Flags, what are those called? The amusement park. Uh, the Gravitron spins like this and you get stuck to the wall. And that's how you're able to stay up because it's spinning so fast. That's what a centrifuge is. That's stuff that goes outward. That's not what we're doing here. Okay, it's a little bit different. We are talking about something that keeps things in circular motion or centripetal, centripetal acceleration. Centripetal acceleration is defined as the tangential velocity squared over the radius. Okay, that's one of our definitions. Does the water stay at the bottom of the cup because of the centrifugal? Yes, very good. The water is staying at the bottom of the cup because of centrifugal, centrifugal force. Centripetal acceleration is keeping it in circular motion now. Very good point. I didn't even think about to describe that. Well done. Okay, we'll pick up tomorrow with this. We'll pick up. Example two says a car moves around a circular track at a constant speed. If the radius of the track is 20 meters and the centripetal acceleration is 6 meters per second squared, then what is the speed of this car? Okay, then what is the speed of this car? Now, Let's go ahead and write down what we know for this problem. What's something that we know right away? Oh, I was going to mention something else, but we know uh, the radius of the track, so we know like um, the r part of the problem. Good. What else do we know? What other variable do you know in the formula right now? Uh, Tori? The acceleration. Centripetal acceleration is 6 meters per second squared. Now, if we go on, we're going to say what we're looking for. We're looking for the speed of the car, which is like the velocity in this problem, that VT. So we're trying to figure out what the tangential velocity or speed is. Again, these are interchangeable for now, simply because of the fact that we're squaring it. R is the radius, the amount of the curvature of the turn that the car is taking. So if the car starts to turn like this, Tristan, like this, you want to finish the circle and then that resulting circle's radius would be the radius of curvature. So in a, in a, in a uh, roller coaster, some of them are loop-the-loops and you can see the circle. But sometimes you see a roller coaster do this. Right? 
That is a circle, technically. It's only part of the circle. So if you were to complete the circle, so even though the roller coaster does this and it comes back around, complete the circle by putting like dashed lines, the radius that would result from that completed circle would be the radius of curvature. Okay, so this is what I'm referring to. Imagine a roller coaster like this. In this part of the curve, complete this circle right here by just putting in a dashed line. And the radius that would result would be the radius of curvature during this part of the path right here at the bottom. Okay? So during that little loop path right there, you're going to feel some acceleration on your body more than just gravity as a result of the circular motion using that radius that's indicated. Here though, we're given the radius, we're given everything else. This is an easy problem to solve because we just have to rearrange. We're looking for the velocity, so let's multiply by r on both sides. And then how do we get rid of the square, everybody? What is it? What? It should be like by now this year, come on. How do you get rid of the square? Square root. I heard geo, but I was the only person I heard in the beginning. Come on. We should all answer with that right away. Square root. That's how you get rid of the square. Take the square root. So go ahead and take the square root of the product AC times R. Okay, the product AC times R. See what you get for the velocity. Round it for the sake of this to the nearest tenth. To the nearest tenth. Sorry, so what do you get for velocity for this problem? 11. 11.0 if you round, because it was, was it like 10.95? Yeah, let's talk about that real quick, because on your test some people were making a mistake. If the answer is 10.95, and I tell you to the nearest tenth, then yes, this 9 rounds up. Well, how do you round up a point nine? You round up 10 to 11, but you still want to write 11.0 as your answer, okay? With units of meters per second, okay? There are some even figures involved. We haven't even gotten into that just right now. But again, 11.0, 11.0 when you're rounding this up. Okay, but keep the point O to indicate that it is rounded to the nearest tenth. So show that when you do round. Okay? Now, if that's the accelerate, if that's the, sorry, that's the velocity. The acceleration felt in this problem is 6 meters per second squared, which is less than 9.81. So this person going around the turn doesn't even feel like 1G of, uh, 1 g-force, not even 1 g-force in this problem. Had the acceleration been greater than 9.81, then they would feel more than one gravitational force or one g-force. If you have the acceleration, it would be, you would feel the gravity pulling you down, 9.81, but you would feel that exact same amount of weight pulling you against the side door of the car. So would you be like, lift, like lift the pedal a little bit? It'd be kind of a weird situation, yeah. You would kind of be like floating. If you, if you go fast enough, you can kind of float above the ground. That's the gravitron. When you go to the amusement park, and you get in the gravitron and it starts spinning and you're against the wall, you feel your body get like sucked to the wall and you feel pretty much weightless, that's what's going on. Your body is pulling you to the side of the wall with enough, norm with enough force, normal force is pushing back, and then friction is elevating you, holding you on the wall there. So you would eventually start to kind of float. Yeah. All right, let's take a look. Centripetal force. Centripetal force is just like the normal, or just like the centripetal acceleration, Okay, it's directed toward the center, but we're looking at the force that exists now. Remember Newton's law tells us that F equals MA. We have A from the last part. We had a formula for A. The formula for A was AC equals VT squared over R. So instead of writing F equals MA, we simply write FC equals MAC. The centripetal force equals mass times the centripetal acceleration. So this is a specific case of Newton's law. Now, we're going to replace AC, and I'll circle it so you can see what I'm saying, replace this AC with the definition of AC, and that's what you get right here. Just simply plug this in by substituting it in. So you get the mass times this VT squared over R, that's what this formula is in the box on the right. Now, one thing I'm going to tell you now, you're not going to be given this formula on the test. And the reason being is as follows. You're given Newton's law right here, a circle in blue. You're given this formula on the test, so you should always be able to come up with this formula just by plugging in the expression for acceleration into acceleration. Again, does that make sense? You're not given the FT, FC formula, centripetal force, because you have F equals MA. Plug in AC in for A, and that's what you get as a result. So you could always do this by yourself. You could also just find the acceleration and then plug it in for AC and multiply by mass to get your centripetal force. 
tangential velocity. Okay, it's the same as the tangential speed. It's the speed of the object that's traveling in circular motion. How fast they're actually traveling. Okay, not the angular speed. We talked about the difference there yesterday. Angular speed is like, you know, 360 degrees every second. That'd be like a rotational speed. This we're talking about the actual speed along the path. Okay. All right. Let's continue on to the next. We spoke about this table yesterday, believe it or not. And we spoke about it quickly, but we didn't go to each example. But remember, centripetal force is not an actual force. Okay, it's an entity that is kind of like a, a dummy variable, it's called in math. It takes the place of something. Now, what provides a centripetal force is some real force that's happening. Remember yesterday when I was spinning that cup? What was keeping it in motion? What was providing that cup from not flying off into space? There was something that attached my hand to the cup. The string. And what was it? Tension. The force of tension. So the first one, let's write tension in here. So the force of tension is what provides the centripetal force in this problem. Okay, the force of tension. How about the second one? A car traveling around a track. What provides, what provides that car's ability to stay in circular motion? Uh, friction between the tires and the road. Exactly right. Friction between the tires and the road. It would be gravity. So the force would be the force of friction. Gravity keeps it down on the ground, but friction is what's keeping it... You ask the question, focus. But friction is what's keeping it from sliding out. Remember, something in circular motion wants to slide off its path. It wants to go tangent to the circle. It wants to follow the laws of inertia. Inertia tells us that an object in motion wants to stay in motion. So an object moving in a circle wants to just go off tangent to the circle because that's the direction of its motion, but friction keeps that car in a circular path. Gravity keeps it on the ground. Okay? A roller coaster in a loop-the-loop. -loop. What keeps the person from flying off the roller coaster. Think about it. That's the force. Again, what's the force? Centrifugal. Cent cent centrifugal, you're saying? But that's not really a force. That's an idea. What's the force that's a reaction to that? Centrifugal. You're on the right track. The person's flying outward, so that's like the centrifugal feeling. They want to move outward. But what's pushing them back to keep them in the cart? Normal force provided by what? It is centrifugal. It, we're saying that. It's the centrifugal idea is that pushing them out. But what's pushing them back in? Yeah, yeah. But directly, what are they sitting on, people? The seat. Here's what happens. You're on a roller coaster. As you start to go up a loop the loop your body wants to shoot off. So your butt is pushing against the seat. That's that centrifugal feeling you're having, Teresa. That's what you're mentioning, centrifugal, because your body wants to fly out of the circle. The seat pushes back with a normal force. So it's the normal force, in this case, from the seat. Okay, the normal force from the seat that's doing that stuff. A stunt devil in an airplane. Okay, now this is a little bit different. What's keeping the airplane, not the stunt devil at this point, not the person, the person is clearly in the seat because the harness and the, and the seat itself. What is keeping an airplane in circular motion when it does its own loop-to-loops? There's two answers here, by the way. It's not just one. There are two forces that are maintaining a, a plane stability. Oh. What are those two forces? You might not know them. It's okay if not. Good. So the force of, in a plane, we call that drag force or friction. What's the other one? Lift force, very good. And we'll talk about lift force at the end of the year when we talk about fluid mechanics and Bernoulli's principle. And lift force comes about from a pressure differential. If there's more pressure on one side of the wing, it provides lift. That's how a plane lifts off. Enough velocity creates a pressure differential causing the plane to lift. When a plane wants to decrease or slow down, you see the flaps adjust, you see the flaps change, and that provides more or less drag. So it's a drag force and the lift force. It's really a balance of those two things that enables a plane to do a loop the loop. Okay? We will look at the wind tunnel app at some point for that. Yeah, we will. Now, an electron in orbit around the nucleus. This one is something that you might not know what the force is called, but give me an idea of what's going on here. What's keeping it in orbit around the nucleus? Yeah, the attraction. Very good. The attractive force. What is a proton's charge? You might know this from, you know, physical science. 
And what's an electron's charge? So there's an attraction there, right? There's always an attraction between opposite charges. That is called the electrostatic force. You don't need to know that word. Okay, you don't need to know that word, but you should be able to describe what's happening here. So that for, just say a force of attraction between the proton and the electron. Okay, but in words, the force is called electrostatic. It's one word. You will need to know that word later in the year when we talk about electricity and magnetism. But for now, I'm not going to ask you to know that vocabulary. And finally, the last thing, a satellite that's in orbit around a planet. Gravity. gravity. Good, Nina. Gravity or gravitational force. We'll just say gravity. We always call it that. All right, so again, centripetal force is not an actual thing. It's an entity that can be measured by the velocity, the mass, and the radius. You can then compare that to the tension in the rope to see if you, you know, it's too much for the rope so the rope would snap or it's too much to keep it in orbit. If a, if a satellite is traveling too fast, the centripetal, the centripetal force needed would not be enough, would not be enough, the gravity would not be enough to provide the centripetal force and the satellite would actually go on into space if it's traveling too fast around the orbit. James. So centripetal and are kind of effect. Exactly. Absolutely. They're theoretical ideas. And they can be proven mathematically, but something provides those things. Something provides them always. Okay, which is kind of tough to wrap your mind around. I know for me, I didn't really understand that really well until I was in college when I was studying dynamics and engineering. I really didn't. I always thought centripetal force was a thing. It's not really a thing. It's an idea. It can be measured, and then it can be compared to the force that's being provided. So if you measure the centripetal force on an object, it comes out to be 1,000 newtons. But you know that the rope can only withstand 900 newtons of tension, that means that the rope is going to snap. You're putting too much centripetal force on it. So it's an idea, again. It's not an actual thing. Okay, we'll take a look at that with this example right here. So imagine you're in a project adventure course, okay, and you have to swing on a rope to move between two islands. So you have two islands here. There's a rope that's fixed. Here's the ceiling. Here's the rope. And there's the person standing here holding on to the rope. Okay, and they're about to swing on this rope. What kind of a what kind of an object that we've talked about already this year is this analogous to? Indiana Jones. It looks like Indiana Jones, yes. What is it? A pendulum. Isn't this just a pendulum? A person swinging back and forth is clearly a pendulum. Now, if a pendulum were to go all the way around, what shape would it make? Circle. So this is really circular motion. So what I want you to think about is the fact that you really have circular motion, and it's going to kind of get a little bit distorted, but that's kind of a circle. Where's the center of the circle? Yeah, the, the, where the rope is connected. Yeah, the, the junction where the rope is connected, right here. That's the center of the circle, right there. Eight's the radius. Okay, so what's the radius? Eight. Eight, and that's the key here. We're told that the length of the rope that the person is swinging on is eight. So you don't necessarily realize that that's radius right away because you're told it's a length of a rope. But if you draw the diagram and label this as 8, well, that's the length of the rope. It's also the radius of the circle. And that's why I tried to emphasize that little loop-the-loop -loop and that little, chair, that little uh, curve there at the bottom. You need to complete the circle to see this. You're given the um, allowable force, the force of tension that the rope can withstand as 100 newtons. That's how much the rope can withstand, 100 newtons. Okay, the force of tension in the rope. Again, the radius is 8 meters, and the person's mass is 60 kilograms. We want to find what the maximum allowable speed is so that this rope doesn't, what? Break. Snap or break. If you swing too fast, it will break. So what we'll do is this. We'll say, well, here's our formula. Our formula is Fc equals mvt squared over r. We are trying to find VT in this problem. We are trying to find VT. Now, what should we set FC equal to? Why, James? Why 100? It's the maximum allowable. If FC was anything bigger than 100, what would happen? The rope would snap. If FC is less than 100, we haven't used up the full potential of the rope then. So if we want to know what the velocity is so that it would only be 100 newtons, let's set it equal to 100. So we'll set the centripetal force equal to the tension. So just put 100 in here. 
Okay, the mass is 60. We could solve algebraically, by the way. I haven't done that here. Okay. So let's multiply by 8 and divide by 60. And I didn't use units for the other, so I'm just going to drop my units for now. They're all in standard units, so I'm good to go. And that equals VT squared. But I don't want VT squared, so what should I do? Square rooted. Okay, that will give me what the velocity is that this rope can withstand. Any velocity bigger, the rope will snap. The rope will snap. Does that mean you can't round up? Correct. In this kind of a problem, you don't want to round up, you want to round down. Yeah. Absolutely. That's a good point to make. And I don't know if I did that in my own video. I should think about that. I wonder what the exact answer was. I rounded to 3.65. I hope I rounded down. What is the exact answer that you get? Give me like four decimals so we can see where we'd round to. 3.65148. All right. So what I did was I rounded to 3.65 to round down. 3.6 also works, but if you rounded to 3.7, technically speaking, it wouldn't work because that would exceed this velocity. Any velocity bigger than this is going to snap the rope. So we could say, what could we use instead of an equal sign? Sure, an approximate or inequality is probably better, right? So let's say that VT must be less than or equal to this number, right? See what I'm saying? The velocity in this problem it could be equal to 3.65, but it's going to be that or less, for sure, so that the rope would not snap. Any velocity bigger would give a centripetal force bigger that would cause it to actually snap. Okay, that would cause it to actually snap. We need to all focus. Some people aren't focusing. Not everybody, but those know who they are. Focus. Let's go. So VT in this problem has to be less than 3.65, less than or equal to. Okay? Questions on this? Questions? I want to keep moving. We have a lot to do today. I mentioned that. The next thing we want to look at here is the gravitational force that occurs between two bodies. And this is something that we talked about in the beginning of the year. We talked about forces and field forces. Now, and I, I, I joked, I think, to the guys, and I said, you could always say that there's a force of attraction between you. Remember I said that? Yeah, it's a lame pickup line, not a pickup line, but whatever. So, if you have these two objects here, a textbook and a water bottle, you don't notice it, <laughs> you don't notice it, but really here, there's a force of attraction pulling these two together. The reason you don't notice it is because the Earth, the Earth is providing a force of gravity that's much greater than anything that can be provided on, by an object on the Earth. So naturally, they're not being pulled together, this bottle is being pulled down to the Earth. If I let go of it, what's pulling it? The Earth is pulling it down. It's kind of crazy to think about. It's not falling, it's being pulled down. The earth is literally pulling this down when I let go. It's pulling down with so much force that I can't withstand it. But these are not being pulled together. If you calculated the force between these two objects, it would be so minuscule. It would be a decimal value. It would be tiny. And the reason being is simply because of this gravitational constant. Okay? It's also because of their masses. But the gravitational constant is what makes it so small. This is a gravitational constant that is the same throughout the entire universe. It's not how little g is 9.81 on Earth, and it's 1.6 on the Moon, and it was like, I think, 26.9 on Jupiter. We did that in the lab that time. Well, big G is a gravitational constant, but it is constant throughout the entire universe. It is not specific to Earth. Okay? Now, this is where the formula Fg equals mg for Earth comes into play. And we take the mass and multiply by 9.81, and we get our weight, or the force of gravity. This formula is where it actually comes from. I'm not going to go into the derivation for the sake of time, but I can show you if anybody wants to actually see it. It's kind of cool. You can see where 9.81 comes from using this formula. Okay? Now, what do you think M1 and M2 are? Mass. That's the two objects that are getting turned. Yeah, the mass of the two objects. Now, R is not a radius. And that's what's misleading in this problem. So let's write this down. R is the distance from center to center of the two objects. R is the distance from center to center of the two objects. Now, we are assuming these objects are spherical, so we're talking about the actual center, even though it's really what's called the center of mass. And the center to center. So if I have the Earth over here, 
and I've got the moon out here, and I want to know what the R value is in this problem, I need to think about the fact that we're going from this center to this center. Here's the radius of the Earth. Here is the radius of the moon. Here is the gap between them. We'll call that D for distance. Okay? So the radius of the Earth plus the distance plus the radius of the moon is the actual distance from center to center. Again, it's the entire distance from here to here. You have to add those three numbers up. You get a number, and that's what R is. Then you have to square that whole quantity. Okay, James? So does this mean that even though it becomes negligible at a certain point, gravity has no distance? If, if, if it's being divided by such a large number, it wouldn't matter how far apart things are. The thing is this, James. The mass of the Earth and the Moon is so much greater that you're actually going to feel force. So you have to compare it relatively. Like something in this part of the universe and something in that Oh, yes! Absolutely. As the, and I was going to mention this. As the distance increases, as the, this is a really good point. He's thinking about, what you're thinking right now is calculus. You're doing a limit, actually, right now. You know the limit as the denominator becomes infinite, the function becomes zero? Fernando's like, yeah, yeah. So, James, to, to, to piggyback your question, this is a really good point. Okay, someone to know. Now, think about this. As the distances get further and further apart, what James is saying is the force of gravity felt becomes negligible completely. Something on one side of the universe has no effect on the other side because they're so far apart. The reason is your denominator is getting so big. Remember the analogy I gave you guys? If you have a pizza and like say Gio and Tristan are splitting the pizza, you each get a half of the pizza, right? But then Aaron and Katie and Teresa and Isabella and everybody else in the room comes in to join, right? Suddenly how much pizza do you each get? Small piece. What if the whole school split one pizza? How much do you get? A little bit, right? Like a crumb. So here's what's happening. You're dividing by a bigger and bigger and bigger number. Thus, the overall amount is smaller and smaller and smaller. So James is making that analogy here. He's saying as the, radi as the distance between center to center, almost a radius, is getting bigger and bigger, the overall feeling of gravity gets smaller and smaller and smaller. Okay? If objects get closer, what do you think happens then? A stronger force. What's a good analogy is the magnetic force. Who here has used a magnet before? I hope everybody's... You've ever put a magnet on the fridge? Yes. You've used a magnet. What happens when the magnet is here and the fridge is here? Do you feel anything? Yeah. No. You feel something, really? This far, a magnet this far away from a fridge? I think like a normal magnet. Yeah. If you get close to the fridge, though, what do you feel? Yeah. A pull. Right? If you actually hold a magnet, like an actual magnet that's in a magnetic shape, and you were to put it near a metal object, it's not going to feel anything, but as you get closer, you'll feel that pull. Okay, it's the same thing with the force of gravity, but you don't notice it because it's negligible. You don't notice the force between my iPad and this water bottle because it's negligible. Because the masses are so small here. The masses are so tiny, this numerator becomes so small. And look at G. It's times 10 to the negative 11. That's a decimal. That's point oh six six seven. It's a tiny number. So your numerator is so small that it doesn't matter that these are close together. Okay? But the force of magnetism is a little different. We'll talk about that later in here. That is a little bit stronger when it's close. Wait, I still don't understand the difference between um, 6 point, like, so, like whatever that is, and 9.1. Um, this is a gravitational constant that is used in this formula throughout the universe. Little g is specific to Earth, and that's the different formula. Remember, it's fg equals mg. Okay, it's a different formula specific to Earth. This is anywhere in the universe. Right, also, okay? when, when you put like two positive magnets, like, they repel. Like, yeah. That's a force of repulsion. It's not, sim it, it's not similar to gravity because gravity is a force of attraction only. Gravity, there is no repulsive force. Okay, it's only an attractive force. Mm -hmm. Let's look at example four. Two dump trucks of equal mass. So big dump trucks we're talking about, okay? Just to show you, I want to see in this answer, see how small of a force you'll get, or see how small of a force that exists. Has a gravitational force of 4 times 10 to the negative 5th newtons. So we're talking point oh 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 four newtons. A very small force between those dump trucks. But it does exist. There is a force. Okay? Now, they're five meters apart. That's like 15 feet apart. Okay, approximately 15 feet. Now, from center to center, we want to determine what their masses are. What are their actual masses? So let's go ahead and take a look at our formula. Now, 
The problem that most people run into here is they say, well, we have two variables, M1 and M2. What can we do to make this easier? What can we do to make this easier? So, Gio, what should we do? Not add them. So just call them. Just call them M. You start it right, Gio. They have the same mass. So call each mass just M. Don't call them M1 and M2. Just say M times M, which is really M, M squared. squared. Not 2 M. It's M squared. M times M, not M plus M. Okay? So really write your formula like this. Okay, which is really M squared. What if it didn't work out that way? That you would need some other piece of information. Yeah. And that's not F times G, remember, on the left here. This is F, this is a subscript. Subscript, subscript. I'm not doing a good job of writing that either. I'll write it better in the next line. Now, we want to find the mass of each dump truck. How do I get rid of that R squared that's currently being divided? Multiply. How do I get rid of the G? You could definitely, the capital G, capital G. Okay, it's currently being multiplied, opposite of multiplying. We divide. Why is it still there? I'm trying to cross it off, but I'm on the... I was just wondering. Oh, it's just me. I was trying to move it. It was moving the page. So we have M squared equals FG R squared over capital G. But what do we want? Do we want M squared? What do we want? So what do we do? Square root it. You're going to see a lot of square roots in these problems, if you notice already. Okay, a lot of square roots because a lot of things are square. So the mass of each jump, dump truck is the square root of FG times R squared all over big G. Now, at this point in time, I know it's a little bit difficult because you have scientific notation. So practice on your calculator real quick plugging this in. Practice on your calculator plugging this in. If you're having struggles, if you don't know how to type in scientific notation, just raise your hand. I'm going to come by and walk around, okay, and I can show you how to do it. But the command you're going to use is second and then the comma. The comma is above the number seven. That puts like a capital E on the board. So try it real quick, and then I'll go over it. Yeah, but in your calculator, it's a lot easier just to type it in scientific notation. So take your calculator and practice. So it takes place of times 10. G is a constant. No, G is given. Guys, G is given on the formula sheet. You don't need to memorize G. Yes, very good. So on your calculator, press 4, then press 2nd, and hit that comma. It'll bring up a capital E. And that E takes the place of this part right here times 10. So on your calculator, it should look like the following. When you type it in, it's going to say 4e and then press negative 5. Make sure you use the negative symbol and not the minus sign. The negative symbol is at the bottom by the decimal. Is that clear? See the minus at the bottom down there? By the, the negative at the bottom down there? Wow, now I'm saying the wrong word. Well, you've got to multiply it by 5 squared, divide it by the other one. That's like so we're having a test on Friday. This class, the test is on Thursday. Thursday. Tomorrow we're gonna we're finishing today. We're reviewing tomorrow. Does that mean problem sets you do? I'll talk about that. They're they're not gonna be doing until the day of the test. I'm gonna switch it. So the homework from this section will be due tomorrow. We'll review tomorrow for like 20 minutes or so. Then you'll have some time to do the problem sets tomorrow. The problem set will be due until the day of the test. That's still Thursday. It's Thursday. There's only seven problems in the problem set. And, and you're working with a partner. There are seven total problems, Joey. Right? It'll take you about eight minutes to do them. No oh, joke. Yeah, okay. problem sets are really short. How many problems are you doing? I think about six. I think it's about six. Seven, two, and seven, three is that's it for the test. It's a short one. It's like a 40 point test.
Hey, check your emails, guys. I wrote all this in email about the, the test and stuff. I'll explain it at the end of class. The homework will be due tomorrow, but the problem set will not be due tomorrow. What do we get for a number? Very good. I'm going to round to the nearest kilogram in this case. This is around, just so you know, around 8,000 pounds. A dump truck is about 4 tons. This is the actual mass of a dump truck. Okay? A dump truck weighs around 4 tons when it's filled. This is about 4 tons. A ton is almost 1,000 kilograms. It's about 2,000 pounds. Okay? Question real quick. Or not question, but a statement. If you had trouble with the scientific notation in your calculator, I really expect to see you either tomorrow morning at office hours or at some point in the day tomorrow with a free. I want to go on to the next example so we can finish this up so you can do your homework tonight and you can do it well. But if you're having trouble with scientific notation, ask me or at least ask a classmate or just literally Google how to use scientific notation on a calculator and it will show you the steps on a graphing calculator. Okay, you could ask Fernando to come by and show you, but for now I want you to, shh, I want you to focus on this. Guys, come on, we're doing well. Don't lose focus. Example five. What happens to the force of gravity between two objects if the distance between their centers is doubled? Okay, we said a moment ago, and James made the statement for us, that as objects spread further apart, the amount of gravity goes down. As the objects get closer, gravity goes up. So they're moving a farther apart. So what's going to happen generally? It's going to go down. Yeah, it's going to go down. So we can start by saying decrease. But that's not enough. And I'll tell you now, I'm going to give you a major hint that this will be a multiple choice question. It will not be mathematical. I will not give you numbers for mass and distances. It will be multiple choice. And what I'll do is this. The multiple choice answers will say it decreased by a factor of 2. It increased by a factor of 4. It remained the same it increased by a factor of three-fourths. So you have to actually figure it out, not just increase or decrease. But you can at least rule out some choices, right? If there's a choice that says the force of gravity increases by a factor of whatever, rule it out right away. Because clearly the force of gravity is going to decrease because they are moving further apart. Okay? James? So, um, would it be... Don't give the answer yet, James. You might know it. Hold on. I want to go through the steps. Because it's going to be more intricate on the test than this. Okay, and I'll explain what I mean. So, let's take a look at our force of gravity formula. Just write it down, please. And let's write next to this just the word before. Okay, this is normally the, the formula. G, M1, M2 over R squared. Remember, that G could go on front, it could go in the numerator, it doesn't really matter because it's a multiplier either way. It's still a factor in the numerator either way. Now, if I double the distance between center to center, which variable am I changing? Everybody. R. 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 That was two or three people. Good, all right. Why not M? Because M is the... And G is a constant. So clearly nothing's changing up top. You're just changing the denominator. And you're doubling the distance, right? So let's write this now. Let's write FG equals G... M1, M2, and we're doubling the distance. So this is 2R now, and we have to square that whole thing. It doesn't matter. The G could be out in front, or the G could be in the numerator. Either way is fine, because it's still multiplying either way. Okay? I think on the formula sheet, I put the G out in front, but it doesn't have any significance whether it's in the front or the top in this problem. So take a look, people. Take a look. The quantity 2r is squared. Your laws of exponents from algebra 1 tell you that you need to square both entities if it's a product. This is called a power of a product. Power of a product. You have to distribute the 2 to both. So what does your denominator become as a result? 4r squared. Four R squared. Okay, so this really becomes... What's the only difference between the before and after? The denominator and that 4. And when you divide by 4, isn't it like putting a 4 in the denominator? 
So really, what would happen to the force of gravity? It would be a fourth of what it was. Or it would decrease by a factor of four. Let's write that down. It decreases by a factor of four. Or you could say the force of gravity is one-fourth of the original. It's like taking a pizza pie again, and you have the whole thing to yourself, but then your three siblings come in the room, and suddenly there's four of you. Now you don't have the whole pie, you have a fourth, right? You'd be dividing by four instead of dividing by one person. Okay? What if, let's see who's really grasping it, ready? What if the distance from center to center tripled instead of doubled? How would this change, Lisa? It would decrease by factor nine. Nine. Because this would become a three, wouldn't it? This would be a three if the distance tripled. What's three squared, everybody? Nine. Could you say it decreased by a factor of nine or it decreased by one nine? You could say it changed by a factor of one nine. It wouldn't be increased because that's technically the wrong word to use there. Even though you're saying one ninth, mathematically it is true, yes. But word, you wouldn't word it that way, it doesn't make sense. But mathematically you are right to say that. So on the test, you... You, you should say it changes by a factor of one ninth, or it decreases by a factor of nine. Are you trying to trip something like that? No, 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 I would never do that. I'll use the word increase or decrease, I'll tell you right now. Follow-up question, you should know this, and this is a good follow-up for your test. What if at the same time, let's go back to where it was just double, not tripled. Okay, can I erase what I just did? Yeah, I can. All right, so let's go back to this scenario where it's just doubled and not tripled. So this is what we have right now, right? What if one of the masses was also doubled? What would happen? What if one of the masses, not both, but one of them, was also doubled? What would change in this problem? Tell me, where would I, where would I change the formula? If one of these masses doubled, what would I do in the formula? Put a two in front of one of the Yeah, put a two like here, watch. Put a 2 in front of one of the M's, which would naturally bring a 2 out in front here, right? It would double the numerator. And then what would happen with the 2 and the 4? You could reduce them, right? And when you reduce them, this would become a 1, this would become a 2. So if one of the masses doubled and this other stuff happened, it would decrease by a factor of 2. It would change. Let's say that both of the masses now doubled. Let's say that both of the masses doubled. We've got 2m1 and a 2m2, which puts what out in front here? Four. What's 2 times 2? Four. 4. What happens to the 4s, though, now? So if both the masses double and the distances from center to center double, is there any effect on it? No. No. The gravitational force would remain the same. What if both masses tripled and the distance from center to center tripled? It would be a 9, because it would be 3, 3 here would give you a 9. The 3 squared would give you a 9. It would still remain the same. So do you see what happens here? Because they're multipliers up top, and the bottom is squared, which is really multipliers. They have no effect on each other. It's like saying 2, 2, and then there's a 2, 2 here. 3, 3, 3, 3 here. Okay? That was the end of this. What you're doing is the homework. You're not doing the problem set yet. Tomorrow in class, we'll review for a little while. I'll give you some time to do the problem set. The homework is seven problems. The problem set is only seven problems. Do the homework tonight. You'll probably even finish the problem set in class tomorrow. Okay, but it's going to be due on the day of the test. The test is on Thursday. It's only 7-2 and 7-3. It's only going to be a 40-point test. Okay?